Hey everybody, welcome back to another Thursday night live at home with Olympus. We're very excited to have you guys here tonight. Um, we have our special guest from last week, uh, or two weeks ago, sorry, uh, returning tonight, Peter Baumgarten. He's going to give us a very special treat. We're going to go through an awesome uh, recap and then photo critique. So tell us about what's happening tonight, Peter. Yeah, so um, two weeks ago, we did the whole Astro Landscape session, got some really good feedback on that. And this time, I get the pleasure of not showing my own photographs, but showing other people's photos and offering some possible suggestions on areas for improvement. So it's, again, a, a really great learning opportunity. And I'm really quite excited to, to see somebody else's work. Right. I absolutely love the times when we can share our community photos out with everyone else. So it's kind of fun and it's always exciting. Am I going to get picked? Am I going to get picked? Uh, you know, it, no, is my Ms. image going to be... None of your shots are in this, I'm afraid. I know, I know, I know. I think I'm excluded. It's okay. <laughs> We've got people from all over tonight, too. Uh, Stockholm, Sweden. We've got the UK and Switzerland, Sydney, oh, Australia. Nice. Australia, y'all, it is... Is it late or early there? It is the wrong time for you guys, but welcome to the show. Thanks for playing today. <laughs> it is tomorrow there already. <laughs> Australia is down there in the future. <laughs> All right. Well, Peter, do you want to get your uh, slides queued up or do you want to give us a little rundown real quick? Um, well, I think we should get right into it and start seeing some of those pictures and uh, any, other, any of the other details I'll definitely fill in as we go through that. So I'm going to call up my... Uh, slideshow here. And thank you guys all for joining. Um, and while he's doing that, I'll go ahead and give you the rundown. If you're new to Home with Olympus, this is our every other Thursday night event that we do live on both Facebook and YouTube. Uh, at the end of this, we always do a Q&A session. So save your burning Peter questions for the very end. Um, and then next week, we are going to be working on building a backyard birding studio. So if you want to join us next week for that, that'll be a lot of fun. But tonight, awesome community feature. I'm going to go ahead and pop your slides up on the screen and get out of your hair, Peter. Do your magic. All right. Thank you, Michelle. And I'm actually looking forward to Steve Ball's uh, presentation next week uh, because I do a little bit of birding myself when I'm not out shooting at night. Um, Michelle did mention asking questions. I definitely encourage you to do so about anything that we talked about during the last session or anything else that might pop into your head this week. And I actually want to start with that. I don't want to get right to the photographs, uh, perhaps keep you in suspense a little bit, but um, I want to address two things before we begin. And the first one is a question. Uh, three people reached out to me via email after the last session about something that I meant to mention and neglected to do so. And that has to do with stacking. And people wanted to know, well, do I leave noise reduction on or do I turn it off when I'm stacking? And the answer is yes and yes. It doesn't really matter. Um, one person specifically wanted to know, well, if noise reduction is on, of course, that doubles the true length of the exposure and that increases the gap in the stars between the shots. Would that make any difference to the software such as Sequitur or Starry Landscape Stacker? And the answer is no. So you might remember this slide from the last session. The image on the left is a single shot. 
And that's the final stack of the 10 images um, blended together in Starry Landscape Stacker. And when I first started using this software, I was excited about the results, but I was also a little hesitant about just how good they might be. So I was leaving noise reduction on and you know, got some really good noise reduction and increase in tonal range, right? Um, well, recently, in order to save a little bit of time while I'm out shooting, I have turned the noise reduction off. So that image that you see on the splash screen for this presentation, while I was shooting that with the fisheye, I was also shooting with the 12. That's me standing there underneath the Milky Way. And that is the final stacked version shot with the 12 millimeter. But a single shot without noise reduction looked like this. And you can definitely see an increase in noise and a decrease in tonal range. If we look at a side by side with the final stacked version, um, you can definitely see far less noise and um, much better dynamic range in the shot. And so this one is the stacked at 100%. You can definitely turn the noise reduction off. You can leave it on if you want, but you can turn it off as well and you'll get great results. Of course, the more images that you stack, the cleaner your end result will be. I usually try to keep it to a minimum of 10. I sometimes go up to 20. I've never gone beyond 20. All right, that's the first thing that I wanted to mention. And the second thing is, although we had Astro April, Astro shooting is definitely not over for the year. We are now into Astro May. That doesn't roll off the tongue quite as well. But if you are planning on going out and shooting, I just want to sort of encourage you to do so and talk about, well, the best time to go out. And the best time is now already. Um, we are in that period of the lunar phases that uh, we're, we've got dark skies now. Assuming you know you don't have the cloud cover and you're away from city lights, the new moon this month is the 11th, just like it was last month, coincidentally. And um, if we look at that period of time in which you can go out and shoot, as long as you're aware of the when the moon is rising and setting, we're already in the thick of that, which we weren't the, the last time I was presenting. And so if I decided to go out tomorrow morning, the 7th of May, um, the moon is rising at quarter to five. Well, that is already uh, late enough at, the, at night that I'd be hitting twilight. So the moon is not going to be impacting me at all. And I can probably keep shooting until sometime in the early uh, 20s of, of, uh, of May and get really good results. And I've already looked at my forecast. I got five nights in a row of clear skies coming up. I hope you do as well, wherever you might be. The um, other thing that you need to keep in mind, of course, is, is the whole clear skies if you haven't been using clear outside, I talked about it last time, it is absolutely uh, the go-to website for weather conditions. And so tomorrow morning, this is my forecast. It looks like I'm gonna have pretty decent conditions, but if you're looking at when to go out and shoot, um, take note of that. Of course, for your location, it will be different, but I've got five hours of, of darkness as, we head towards the summer solstice. That, of course, that time period is going to shorten. And then after summer solstice, it'll lengthen again. But this might be a very valuable tool for you to go out and uh, to do your planning to go out and shoot. The other thing that uh, is definitely worth mentioning for this month is a lunar event. Every month, of course, we have a full moon. And this month, the full moon is on the 26th. But it's a special full moon because we have a total lunar eclipse coming. Unfortunately, it's, you know, not all of us are going to be able to see it. I'm not going to be able to see it here in Ontario. But if you are anywhere around the Pacific, you should get a pretty good viewing. So Australia, Hawaii, um, the western US, the southwestern part of Canada, and anywhere along the Asia Pacific Rim there, you should be able to clearly see a nice um, lunar eclipse. The last time I was able to shoot it was January 2019, and I photographed this sequence. It was brutally cold, minus 30 that night, so I did not enjoy the experience, but I definitely wanted to photograph it. Um, and I just want to go over very briefly some of the key settings. The Learn Center that Olympus has has several articles on photographing the moon and photographing the eclipse. 
but I'm just going to just briefly go over this. The shot that you see in the bottom center, well, those were the settings that I used, and I handheld that. And the reason why that moon is larger than the rest of the moons is because I also used the uh, high res mode. I was shooting with the EM1X and um, the 300 millimeter lens at that time. I think I even used one of the teleconverters on it, but I can't remember 100% on that one. Um, and I was able to handhold that. For most of the other portions of this uh, image, I was also able to handhold. ISO 200, and you can see that even with just about a quarter of the moon showing uh, near the top there, I was still able to get a shutter speed of 1 320th of a second. Under ideal conditions, you want to keep the shutter speed over 1 1 25th of a second because the moon is actually moving through the sky pretty quickly. And, um, you know, you don't want to get that motion blur from the moon. But once you get to the blood red, blood red phase, um, that almost is impossible to maintain. And so by the time it got to the top three images, I was definitely on a tripod. I wasn't hand holding this and I needed to really bump up the ISO and lengthen the shutter speed. So those were the settings there. And uh, it, this was, I think, one of the first times I've ever actually witnessed a blood red moon when I shot this one. And I was just surprised at how dark it is. It certainly is brighter in this image than it was uh, in reality. So it's just something to keep in mind if you do have the opportunity, opportunity to photograph it later on this month. All right. Now on to the, you know, what we're really here for tonight is to look at other people's photographs. I want to briefly talk about the whole process that we went through in order to get some images to critique tonight. When we put this out, I wasn't certain how many we got, how many submissions we would get. We got over a hundred submissions. I was worried we might get two or three and this would be a complete bomb, but over a hundred images, I knew that there was no way that I would be able to showcase all 100 of them. So we uh, narrowed it down to 30. So I've got 30 images to show you. And I tried to get a nice variety of images that would cover most astral landscape shooting situations. If it wasn't astral landscape, it definitely got removed. I did not include any images of you know, the full moon or deep space. There were some shots, they were really nice shots, but that wasn't really the focus of what we're talking about tonight. Um, I also made sure that Olympus sent me those images without any names, without any descriptions, without any EXIF data. I wanted the images to stand on their own um, while I sort of went through the process of whittling it down to 30. Once I identified what those 30 were, I then sent those back to Olympus. They attached the names and the descriptions and so on. And, and so now I know a little bit more about those shots. I wanted to make sure that I didn't choose images based on who shot them because I thought maybe I, I might know some people. Um, and, you know, I, I really wanted the images to stand on their own. All right. So that being said, let's get to the first shot. And as luck or fate would have it, I actually do know this person, but I didn't know when I picked this shot. So hello, Kyle. Uh, Kyle and his wife, Denise, were on a workshop that Olympus sponsored out in Banff a few years ago. So say hi to Denise, Kyle. I hope you're watching. And uh, I love this composition. So this is the Three Sisters in Canmore, Alberta, near Banff National Park, one of our most scenic areas of the country. And I love the way the Three Sisters are sort of bottom center and the Milky Way is stretching out uh, over top of it. So there's, I, I really do like sort of the arrangement of all the elements, but there is uh, some concern about the lighting. And I do want to address sort of how this is lit. Um, it is definitely a little hot in the foreground. The, if you just looked at the grasses in the foreground, you would say, well, they're actually fairly well exposed. But if you compare the intensity there to the trees and the mountains, there is definitely an imbalance there. I don't want to get too technical here, uh, but if you are lighting anything, whether it's portraiture or something like this, you need to be aware of the inverse square law. And I'm not going to get into the technicalities of it, but basically what it states is the further away your light source is from the subject, the dimmer that light is going to be and the more spread out it's going to be. And of course, there's a mathematical relationship to that. And I am finding that in this case, perhaps the light was too close 
to the foreground, right? The light was definitely too close to the to the grasses. Um, and so we've got this fairly well-lit foreground. And that, unfortunately, is then at the expense of what, where we really want our eyes to go, the mountains. Um, right? So here it's quite hot. And then that spreads out. And right, we now have the center part of the trees, you know, fairly intense in, in terms of light. How do you rectify that? Well, while you're out shooting, the ideal situation then is to move that light farther back, um, get it as far, you know, maybe another 50 feet behind you if that's at all possible. If there's, a, you know, another clump of trees behind you, well, that may not be possible. That's often the situation that I'm in because I don't live in an area that's got wide open expanses. So how do I deal with it then? So I'm just gonna grab the light here that I'm actually using to illuminate my pretty face here. But so what I'll often do is just wave the light back and forth during the exposure and try to do that so I get more even lighting. Another option is to raise the light a little higher or tilt it up so that less light is in the foreground. You may also remember last week I uh, or last two weeks ago that I also used a landscape fabric to dim the lighting sometimes if it won't go any dimmer than um, then you've already got it set at so there are things that you can do in um, while you're actually shooting to help improve that the other thing that you can do in post here just to stop our eye from you know going to the uh, grasses at the bottom is just do a slight crop all right, so I'm just gonna cover that up here. And now I think that already helps uh, keep our eye from you know, being drawn to the bottom. As far as the sky goes, I am also gonna suggest that in post, we brighten that up a little bit. There's some really great details that you've captured, but you can pull some more of those details out in Lightroom. And I am gonna make an assumption here that most people are using Lightroom and Photoshop, so I'm gonna talk about those, and I recognize that some people may not. Uh, but I think we could probably pull some details out there. All right, so that was a fairly detailed explanation for this photo, not all of them will be that lengthy, lengthy, but Kyle, thanks so much for submitting. All right, on to this one. All right, I'm not exactly sure where this is. It definitely looks um, like it's in the Badlands somewhere, maybe, uh, in, well, Canada or the US, I'm guessing. Um, this is a tracked and stacked image, and I am blown away by the details in that sky. Um, they are incredible, including the really great color rendition in some of those stars. I'm hoping that you're seeing this on a big monitor. Um, we've got blue star stars and yellow stars and red stars in here, along with sort of the cloud of the Milky Way. Um, I do find myself wishing that the foreground was a little brighter. Because this was stacked, I bet you we could pull a little bit of detail out of that foreground and see some of those really cool linear elements in the rocks and maybe in some of the scrub in in the foreground right um, i might also suggest that if you were reshooting this back in this location that you just turned your camera slightly so here's the frame that you've got and i'm going to suggest that you panned it slightly to the left right because everything outside that frame um there isn't a lot of detail there isn't a lot of interest there but I would like to see a little bit more Milky Way on the left. And so I would, you know, kind of do a crop with the camera and um, open up a little bit more on the left. But otherwise, a great shot. And I love the detail in that sky. Thank you, Gail. Right. I think two weeks ago, I mentioned how much I do like shooting silhouettes. And so I'm a real sucker for those. I really like Ryan shot here from uh, somewhere in Washington state. And I really, it kind of brings me right into the shot. I feel like I'm actually there, uh, you know, and I can, I think I can hear the crickets chirping. Um, normally I would not be a fan of a white balance that is this warm, but in all honest, honesty, I think it works. Um, you know, you might want to play with changing the white balance to something like 3,800 or 4,000, maybe 4,200. This, I think this is a little warmer than that, but I kind of like it the way it is, so maybe not. But I'm also open to experimenting. Um, I also like the, the tree silhouettes. And the one on the far left, right, 
is a nice big tree that kind of follows the line of the Milky Way, but there's not enough of it. So I'm going to suggest one of two things. If you actually were back here shooting this, if I was standing beside you, I would suggest either include more of that tree on the left or none of it at all. Having just a few branches kind of poking in from the side is pulling my eye out of the frame and we don't want that. So either more tree or none at all. So if I'm, if I were framing it, you know, if I move to the left, well then I'd be running the risk of cutting out too much of the Milky Way. And we don't want to do that because it is such a cool backdrop. So in this case, I might suggest framing it to the right. Um, and you know, that would then eliminate that portion on the left right? You don't have that quite nice triangular foreground, but I still think this would work. And I am going to take a little bit of artistic license with this shot, Ryan. I don't know if you had access to that cabin or shed or whatever it might be, but if you did bring a small little LED tea light or something like that that you could put in there, I'm not even too sure that there's a window on that side, but if there were, you might want to just light it up and create something like that. That is a very cheesy window on my part. I just did that in Keynote, um, but it might help increase the story uh, line in, in this shot, but I really do like these kinds of images. All right. Um, Wow. When I saw this shot, that's what I said. I just thought, oh my gosh, look at the Nubble. I had the good fortune of, of being at the Nubble in Maine in just before uh, the pandemic started, so almost two years ago now. And it is a, a beautiful, iconic lighthouse in that state. I do like this composition. I think, you know, placing the Nubble almost in the center definitely works. I'm okay with the utility pole there, the Milky Way stretching across the sky, right, from left to right um, definitely works for me. I do find that color of red to be just a little too intense. Um, I'm hoping that you photograph this in RAW. And if you did, I think you might be able to recover some of the details in that. Um, for people who might not be aware of that, I, I don't believe for one moment that this is uh, like a special effect. I think this is just the humidity in the air, so a bit of mist or cloud cover that was going through and you got those kind of that flame-like effect. Uh, I'm pretty certain that that I've kind of seen that before. So, you know, that's not something added in post, but there's no details left in that intense part of the red. And I think we could pull some of that red back and get some uh, more natural looking details. Um, the same thing would apply to the yellow reflection and particularly in the water. You can even see that uh, the smaller building on the left is a little blown out with that white siding. Um, if that can't work while you're shooting, another suggestion would be to take two shots and then blend them. The first shot, expose it for the sky, and that is a really nicely exposed uh, Milky Way. Really nice. Um, and then take a second shot for the foreground and then blend those two together. I would also like to draw people's attention to, let's say, the top corners either one, you will notice that those stars are a little stretched if some of you may have picked up on that. That is not a, a, a problem with the way this photograph was shot. It is absolutely um, part and parcel of shooting with an ultra wide rectilinear lens. The seven to 14 does exactly the same kind of thing. It is just part of shooting with that lens. Um, so I'm not worried about that whatsoever. In post, however, I might suggest that you try to deal with some of the color noise. You don't notice it too much in this image until you look at the water here. I'm definitely seeing some color noise. Now, of course, this is a reduced image that was sent to me, so maybe that's not visible in the original, but if it is, go into Lightroom and try to dial down some of that color noise. But definitely uh, an eye-popping shot. So thanks for sending that, Peter. All right. <clears throat> now we're off to the mountains. And uh, this is a great vista. We've obviously in an elevated position here uh, in Wyoming. So Don, thanks for shooting this. Certainly that meteor strike caught my eye and that is not unusual, especially when you are stacking images. I've had that several times. And so, you know, that's an unusually 
a great uh, large meteor strike. It could be um, a uh, what's it, there's a satellite. Uh, geez, the name is escaping me at the uh, at the moment. Sometimes satellites can do that, and uh, but I fairly certain that this is a meteor strike. But when I first saw this image, I thought, hmm, that kind of looks like a composite to me. And sure enough, uh, Don indicated that this was a composite image. If you look at the lighting on the right-hand side of this shot, that blends in quite nicely. The mountain, the light on the mountains and the light in the sky on the right looks perfect. No issues there whatsoever. But when you look at the left-hand side, you can see that there is a definite contrast, a definite unnatural way that uh, the mountains look compared to the night sky. Uh, that would not happen naturally with that orange glow or yellowish glow and then the nice soft pastel type glow that you get on the mountains at dawn. Um, and so what Don did was he went in at night, shot the sky, and then came back um, and shot the uh, the foreground, tried to put his tripod in the exact same spot. And that, for me, isn't the issue here. What I would suggest doing in a situation like this is try to blend more than two shots. So take the night sky, then take a second shot just at the transition between astronomical twilight and darkness, where the sky is just starting to get lighter, and then maybe one a little bit more into the blue hour, and then your dawn, where you're starting to actually get the mountaintops lit up. And try to blend three images at least uh, to get a better transition. Um, and I think that would make for a more natural looking uh, shot, especially on in that uh, section. The other thing, this is similar to the previous shot with the uh, silhouetted cabin. Um, Right, I, I do see a couple of branches sticking out. If they don't add anything to the shot, then work to get rid of them. Ideally, you want to try to get rid of them while you're shooting, but there are times where I haven't even noticed branches sticking into my frame because things are dark, but that's fairly easy to clean up in post with the clone tool or the healing brush. But otherwise, a great looking image. All right, another mountainscape. I think this is in the Tetons. And uh, we've got this beautiful layered effect. Uh, I like the exposure of the sky, but I was a little surprised to see an ISO of 8,000. So that is, of course, beyond sort of the natural uh, ISOs of the camera. That's where into the extended ISO range there um, with a shutter speed of five seconds. So that combination has created a nicely exposed sky, but I think it's introduced more noise than you need in this shot, Dave. Uh, so I would suggest with, especially with the EM1 Mark III, you know, leave it at ISO 3200, maybe ISO 6400 with the 12 to 40 lens that you were using. Um, and then you could easily triple that shutter speed. So you'd get a similar, um, exposure, but less noise. You know, now if you're stacking, it's not as big a deal, but I'm pretty sure that this wasn't a stack. However, it is two shots blended. So the foreground was shot separately and then blended. But I know that in this case, the tripod stayed exactly where it was. And so we have a different exposure for the ground. That being said, because you're only shooting at ISO 200, you could definitely uh, perhaps bring out some more details in that foreground. Now, the one thing that I might suggest is to tilt the camera down a little bit. It is a nicely exposed sky, but once you get past Beetlejuice here, um, right there, this is Orion. If you can't tell, that's Orion, and there's Beetlejuice. There's not really much uh, of interest above that, so I might have tilted the camera down, added a little bit more foreground, and then perhaps... Uh, uh, oh, you know, brought up the exposure of that foreground. But I can't wait to go out and shoot some mountainscapes again when this whole pandemic thing is over. So thank you for that shot. All right, here is our first uh, uh, Milky Way Pano. And the, again, this one sort of just, you know, is an eye popper. I love what I'm seeing here. We've got the entire arc uh, stretching across the sky. I know that Marley was frustrated with the clouds that just wouldn't go away, but they aren't covering too much of the um, of the panel, so it it works. I love the reflection in the bottom right. I love the ripples of sand. 
the sand on the bottom left is seems to lack detail and it seems to be a little mushy, maybe a little bit of uh, color noise. Now, and if the sand is perfectly smooth, you may not be able to pull out any details there. Um, but overall, I, I like what I'm seeing here. I'm going to uh, pick on two things here. And uh, so with the sky, Marley shot eight panels and uh, stitched those two together and she used a tracker. So 120 seconds uh, for each shot in that panel. So this is a pretty big time commitment to create this panorama. But if you look right up here, you can definitely see some star trails. And I'm just, and, and those might be about 120 seconds in length. So I am wondering whether or not the tracker was working for this uh, portion of the of the sky, because we're definitely getting some motion blur here, or some stars moving. It's not the only place, but that's definitely the most uh, noticeable portion. Um, and so, if you were actually shooting this, you might want to check, uh, you know, at the end of every shot, you know, did it work properly? Am I am I getting nice sharp stars? The other issue that I'm seeing here, and it's it's minor and can be easily repaired in Photoshop. In post, when you're stitching these together, and I know she used Photoshop to do this, be careful of how it's stitching it together. Lightroom and Photoshop have gotten pretty good at stitching things together, but you probably can see that there are some boundary lines that are noticeable here. Um, this is, I think, the most noticeable portion of this. I see it in a couple of other spots, but you can clean that up fairly easily in Photoshop, or try doing it again uh, a second time, and it might do it a, a better job. I've also done this manually, where I've actually positioned the images in Photoshop, and rather than having it auto-align them, um, and gotten some good results. But using the clone tool or the healing brush, you should be able to clean those transition points up a little better. But this is a really nice um, uh, uh, panorama. And I know Marley said that she was freezing by the end of it. So it might look like it was a warm evening, but it was anything but apparently. All right. I do want to look briefly at shooting panos. I did not talk about this the last time because of the time limitations that we had, but I don't do panos a lot, but I do them on occasion and I tend to do them in the spring. And so this is the technique that I use. There are other techniques, but this is the one that has worked for me. So first thing I do is I start at the tail of the um, Milky Way. I kind of think of the Milky Way as a serpent going across the sky and I'm shooting from the tail first because it's. I want to move my camera in the same direction that the Milky Way is going and it's going in that direction. Um, then I also want to be able to stack. So I will shoot four shots instead of 10. And so I will shoot 10 or four shots here, one at a time. And you'll notice that I am also shooting in vertical so that I get both foreground and sky rather than shooting in horizontal. First few times that I tried this, I was shooting in, in horizontal and I realized I'm doing too much work. This was with the 12 millimeter, and I still was able to capture both some foreground and all of the Milky Way. And then I just worked my way across the scene, one shot after the other, or a set of four stacks, right, until I get all the way across, right? So each of those would be four shots, move the camera, four shots. I'm not using any kind of special pano head. I'm being very careful in my placement so that I try to keep the horizon in exactly the same position, right? Then I import those into Lightroom. I do my magic in Lightroom with the processing, stack them in Starry Landscape Stacker, and then bring them into Photoshop, right, as layers. I'm not going to go through too much detail here, but I go to the Edit tab, Auto Align, and then I just use Auto. I let um, Photoshop figure out what works best. I certainly don't want a warped horizon, and so Perspective or Auto seem to work the best. It does, of course, skew the, um, the sky, right? In order to keep that horizon straight, we now have, you know, definitely sort of a, almost a, like a keystone in reverse of appearance to it, but it does seem to work. Then I go back into auto blend, right? Use the panorama version as opposed to stacking them, which you can do for focus bracket, focus stacking and so on. Um, and then this is the end result. So this is the cropped version and also uh, with a little bit more um, 
post-processing in Lightroom. That's how I do um, my panos. And, you know, I think in May, if you go out early enough in the evening, you can still get some pretty good panos. If you wait too late in the evening, it might be a little bit more difficult to get the top of the Milky Way. All right, moving on to the next shot. All right, a completely different setting here. Um, I like, I, I love old buildings, and I think this one is photographed quite well. Rick, I'm not 100% sure where this is. I'm guessing somewhere out west again, um, at least out west based on where I sit. I love the artificial lighting that's in here, right? I don't think any of this was lit up by Rick himself. There is a light coming in from another building, a floodlight that's lighting up the one side of this barn, and the also had a light on inside. And I love the way the light is splaying across the grass right towards the camera. So I think that works really well. Um, this is, again, a very warm shot. So I might be tempted to play with the white balance settings in uh, post and maybe cool it down just a little bit so that the building isn't overly orangey yellow color. I mean, I think I still think it works, but I might play with that to see if I get a, a better look to it. The sky is here just definitely a secondary feature. Uh, I believe that Rick was actually out to try to photograph the Aurora and ended up, you know, uh, having this barn catch his eye and took this shot. As far as composition goes, I'm okay with it, but I might suggest moving it a little bit towards the left so that you know, the main, the center part of the barn, the, the end facing us isn't right in the center of the image. So a little to the left and perhaps a little down or even up to get more foreground considering the sky isn't the dominant feature in this. But, you know, I think being able to work with the ambient light that's already there uh, is a skill and you've handled that quite well. All right. Um, I love shots like this one. So Darren, I wish I was there standing with you or taking turns because I love doing these kinds of shots. I don't do them often, but uh, so this is a writing on stone provincial park. The next time I'm out in Alberta, I definitely want to go and try to shoot this. So I love this composition. I think it looks really cool. You were able to stand perfectly still for the duration. I don't know how many seconds that was, but uh, that looks really good. There is something going on on the right-hand side of this image, and I'm fairly certain this has nothing to do with what Darren did, but the right half of the image is slightly out of focus, and I'm not too sure why, because everything on the left is sharp. So um, I don't really have an answer for that, but I think you can see that. I might compare other shots that you took that night and see if they're all like that or if it's just this one and something weird went on. Um, from a compositional standpoint, again, foreground is important. And it's obvious that some more of the foreground was lit up by your headlamp. I might tilt the camera down a little bit because again, the top quarter, top third, there's not a lot going on there. Uh, lots of stars, you know, no offense to the aliens that live around those stars, um, but tilt it down a little bit, get a little bit more foreground, right? And then in post, I might try to bring out some more of the details in that uh, Milky Way, right? The Milky Way is, is stretched nicely across the sky, just over your head. Um, and I think you could probably bring out a few details. Try using the dehaze tool again. The dehaze slider will bring out the contrast um, and uh, might help see some of the, the brightness and details in that Milky Way. But I really do like this kind of a shot, um, especially considering I don't have any kind of landscape around here that I can shoot like that. All right, speaking of rocky outcrops and interesting structures, here's one in Hawaii that Colby shot. I think this is called Pele's Chair. And I love the way you've aligned the Milky Way with the rock outcrop, right? That, you know, I'm pretty sure that was a strategic, definite uh, choice on your part. Um, I'm also envious of the fact that you can see this much of the Milky Way at that latitude. The first thing that always catches my eye in the Milky Way is the horse. 
if you can't see the horse or you didn't know, you didn't see it as a horse before, now you will never unsee it as a horse. You can see the hind legs and the fore legs, you know, one of them lifted up in the head. Um, and we just, where I am at the 45th parallel, we just never get the Milky Way this high up, uh, at least that part of the core. So I really love the composition. Now, I can't tell it, whether or not that was lit up um, from some ambient lighting that was already there, um, or if you lit it up. Two things about the lighting. Number one is the fairly harsh shadow at the bottom of the of Pele's chair right there. If there was a way of bringing out some of the details there, that would be nice, but that is not a big deal, but it is kind of nice to be able to see a little bit more there and not have that harsh shadow line. The second thing I think is a little bit more important. My eye, of course, is being drawn to anything that's a little brighter than other parts, and that, of course, is this grass right here. Um, try to work the composition so that you eliminate that. Um, this makes me think that it wasn't you lighting this up, that it was um, some other ambient light from you know street lights or something on the beach or whatever that is adding the light. I think maybe the only way to maintain the uh, alignment of the Milky Way and the rock outcrop would be to get your camera in front of this uh, this grass. It might make the the pillar of rock a little larger than you'd like, but this is a little distracting. You can clean that up in post if you're comfortable with using the clone tool or the uh, um, the uh, content aware, you can definitely do that in, in Photoshop. All right, moving on. We're gonna deal with another uh, rock feature here. So now we're into Vermont. We've got the Milky Way beautifully stretching across the sky using the 12 to 40 again. So I'm assuming this is at 12. Uh, millimeters. We're definitely seeing some nice color in the sky. I do find that perhaps a little warm. So again, white balance, I would uh, dial it down a little bit. Custom white balance is really easy to change uh, in camera, right? You know, with a super control panel, very, very simple to change. If you're shooting in RAW, of course, you can do that in Lightroom afterwards. I am going to suggest a couple of uh, compositional things here. Well, maybe before I do that, that rock is overly bright. Um, I would figure out a way of toning down that light. Either if you can't dim the light anymore, stand considerably farther back or cover the light with um, some you know, translucent cloth that will, will dim it down because it is definitely a little too bright. In post, you can probably tone it down a little bit uh, by bringing down the highlights slider. Um, I would like to suggest that we include a little bit more of the Milky Way itself. There is a little bit of the core that's missing, so I might have suggested turning the camera slightly to the right. I know that moves the rock out of center, but you could easily get it back to center by shifting the tripod over a little bit. And then let's see a little bit more foreground by tilting down, right? And then you would get that. I also wouldn't worry about that red cell tower light. I'm assuming that's a cell tower. Um, easy to clean up in, um, in Photoshop, all right? So a couple of suggestions on this shot. Otherwise, I think I love the silhouette of the hills in the background. It's a really nice image. Right. Um, who would have thought you could get a beautiful shot like this in New York State? Well, I think there's lots of places that you can go. And I say that because I know in reading Grace's description, she was surprised at how well the Milky Way would show up in, uh, you know, fairly close to where she lives in a fairly well-lit area. I love this shot. Um, I love the pier. It's well-lit. You know, the exposure is really nice here. Um, we're getting some nice reflection of both the pier and the stars um, in the water. Uh, any distractions on the beach that might have been there? She's, you know, cropped with her feet. She's, you know, eliminated those. Um, the Milky Way definitely has an interesting color to it. I'm seeing some really cool purples, which I kind of like. I think it looks really good. If you have the opportunity to go and shoot this again and you want to get into stacking. I think this is a single exposure. There definitely is a little bit of noise in the sky. Stacking will help to eliminate that. But overall, I really like this composition. I, If I were shooting beside you, I don't think I would change really anything about this composition. Um, but 
I might suggest getting into stacking and that would help clean up some of the, the digital noise that is part and parcel of every camera shooting at higher ISOs. But really nice shot, Grace. All right, I'm in an alien landscape here. This is amazing. Lacey, I don't know where in Alberta this is, um, but this is pretty cool. It is a composite blend. Lacey indicated that to me in her description, but I really do feel like aliens are about to land or something like this. Um, the only thing that I can think of to uh, offer a suggestion with is perhaps like it is overly blue. There's a lot of blue in this, which to me is kind of also hiding some of the details. Now I know Lacey definitely wanted to shot the foreground during the blue hour so that she could get more details. I'm wondering if we could get that, you know, um, either, I think this was shot at sunset. Uh, so in the evening, the blue hour in the evening, not in the morning. Um, but if you shot maybe a couple of shots, uh, uh, during uh, civil twilight or nautical twilight, which is earlier than astronomical, um, just to add perhaps a little bit more details in that really cool foreground. Um, perhaps even tilting the camera down to include more texture in the little hill that you were standing on. Cause I really, that caught my eye right away. And I'd like to see a little bit more of that. The sky again in here in a shot like this is kind of secondary. The foreground is really what is attracting my attention and it's a really cool spot. I've never photographed uh, the night sky in the Badlands, either Canada or the US. And I it is on my list of things to do when things open up again. So I really do like this shot. All right, all right. Ricky told a great story, and I'm actually going to read the beginning of this shot. So this is in Hawaii, and I believe Ricky was on vacation, and he said, when our babies woke us up at 3 a.m. on our first day in Hawaii, we looked out the window and saw a glorious Milky Way. So we all walked down to the beach for some star stargazing and a little astro photo shoot. Um, so I can sort of just imagine that on holiday. You've got your kids with you. They get all upset in the middle of the night, and right, just take them out onto the beach and enjoy enjoy the scene. And I, I love that story and I love the image. Um, I love the fact that you're doing a, a selfie here. If you, uh, I, I don't know for sure whether or not you are a, a truly transparent person, Ricky, uh, but I can definitely see through you in this shot. There are times where you may have actually, where you may actually want to do that on purpose. Um, but I can tell that you moved into position for this shot during the exposure. Um, if you were the one that was actually triggering the, the shutter release and then kind of getting into position, I might suggest putting a time delay on there. You can easily program a time delay or just use one of the uh, built-in time delays. I think it's 10 or 12 seconds. Um, and that gives you ample opportunity to get into position um, so that you, can't be seen through so that you're not fully transparent. Um, the other thing, I know that while you were shooting, you probably couldn't eliminate this, but we can clearly see the tripod, all right? And I've done this before as well, where there's a light behind me that I just can't get rid of, and I end up with the tripod shadow. Easy to clean up in Photoshop. Get in there, use the, the healing tool, and, uh, right, very simple to do, and in the end, you won't be able to see it at all. Um, you can do exactly the same thing with a couple of those footprints that are noticeable, right? Now, my eye is instantly pulled to areas of contrast, right? And I'm seeing a lot of light areas on the far left of this shot. Whatever building that is, whether it's the hotel or something like that, those bright porch lights are pulling focus. And so I might suggest, again, shifting the camera slightly to the right so that we could get rid of um, that portion, right? Um, I know that this is two shots based on the description that Ricky provided. This is two separate images because of the clouds. Um, those clouds are very hot. They're very bright. Um, and you might be able to tone those down in in Photoshop or Lightroom, pull the highlight slider down so that they're not quite that bright, but they are pulling focus away from the very cool Milky Way. Now I know that clouds were coming in and I can see them right on the horizon that 
eliminated that. But here's something that I've discovered when I am stacking. If you are ever shooting at night and there are clouds, you know, smaller clouds like these moving through the frame, take a bunch of shots. And when you stack those, they almost completely disappear. The stacking software will get rid of most of the cloud and still keep the stars. Um, it works fairly well. There's nothing wrong with clouds in your shot, right? I like that in, in many images, but these are uh, a little too hot because of course of all of the lights from the buildings. Uh, but cool story and great shot, Ricky. All right, I am getting a little tired of the ha Hawaii shots, people. Um, I'm definitely nowhere near Hawaii, and I would love to go there. But here's a really nice shot from Madeline uh, in Hawaii. And um, this is just a really nice composition. I love the placement of everything in here. Uh, even during a longer exposure, uh, the palm leaves fluttering in the breeze, that's not a big deal. And we actually do have a bit of cloud cover here no problem at all. I love this line. I love how my eye travels naturally through that sort of path to the sea. I love the textures of the rock. If I could offer any suggestion at all here, it would be just try to you know get rid of those uh, footprints in the sand. And I don't think you could do that while you were there. If you wanted to maintain sort of that line and so on, you I think in, in post, it would be fairly easy to do. All right, um, so that looks really good. And I love the lighting. I'm guessing that this was lit up by the moon. There's some nice even lighting in here, but really nice image. All right, another coastal scene. I'm jealous of the coastal scenes. And this now we're in Australia. So I never get to, I've never seen the Milky Way from the Southern Hemisphere. Um, this is awesome. I love the composition. I love the Milky Way and the direction that it's going, starting sort of from the big rocks over to uh, the uh, open sea. This is a moonrise. The only suggestion that I have here is while you were shooting this, if the moon, if you could position the camera or capture the, uh, the moon before it actually showed up from behind that rock, perhaps get more of the glow that is the, uh, you know, that, uh, accentuates the, the rock outcrop. Um, I am finding that that lit up spot from the moon is a little hot, uh, just a little too bright. Ideally, when you I do this with the same thing with the sun, um, I only want a tiny sliver of the sun showing around an object like a tree or if I'm shooting into the sun, I would apply the same thing to the moon. Try to position your camera or get there before the moon is too exposed, just a tiny sliver so you get a, a, a faint flare, but not too much. Otherwise, really nice image. I'm jealous, all right? Another coastal scene, now we're into the UK and we've got the Milky Way smack dab in the middle stretching skyward. Um, we definitely have a lot of satellites going through this image. I've seen them in a couple of other ones, but I thought I would save it for this one. Easy to get rid of. Again, use the, um, the heel tool in Photoshop. I've talked about that a lot, but there are things that we can't control while we're shooting that we can easily get rid of. And that's really simple to do uh, briefly. Choose a, a brush size. If you know anything about the heel tool, choose a brush size that's just a little wider than the diameter of that line. Start on one end, press the, like click on that end once, then move to the other end, hold the shift key down and click to at the other end and the whole line disappears. Really simple. It's a two second job um, if you're familiar with it, right? Um, I do find myself wishing I could see more of the foreground. I wanna see that coastal scene. I wanna see, um, I don't know if that's Jupiter there reflecting in the water. I wanna see more of the foam, the sea foam that's there. If I could make a, a compositional suggestion here, it would be to get the horizon at about this level. So tilt the camera down um, and let us see more of that shoreline. If there isn't, um, you know, much interest there. Maybe you could get closer and, you know, let us see more of that water and some of the reflection that's there. Um, but it's a great, uh, great scene. 
All right, here we are. This one's definitely closer to home. Michigan is my neighbor. Uh, so definitely the same sort of latitude. This is the way the Milky Way would look for me. And it's a great composition, right? Strategically placed so that the Milky Way is right above the key foreground subject, that beautiful home. Um, and also the foreground has some nice lighting to it. I'm not too sure uh, from Michael's description how that was lit up. I don't know if there is some moonlight here or if there's some other lighting, either ambient or you know, like LED panels or something like that. But it is a really nice composition. Um, no real suggestions. I think that's pretty much the way I would do it if I were standing here. So nice shot. All right. Now here's a cool image. Um, this is kind of thinking outside the box or thinking under the bridge. I normally would never suggest bisecting an image completely in half, but I like this. So Ted is underneath this bridge in Letchworth State Park in New York, and um, he has lit up the bottom with some light painting. I'm not too sure if it's an LED panel or a headlamp. It, it's fairly even lighting, so I'm guessing it's an LED panel, but maybe not. On the edges, though, both on the left and the right, I am seeing some hot spots. I am seeing it that it is a little overexposed. So I would suggest, um, it, when shooting this is turn the camera and shoot in vertical mode so that you know we were framing it more like this and that would eliminate sort of those uh, very bright areas um, that are kind of interfering with my enjoyment of the main subject here the the Milky Way and the bridge now if you were of course using a fisheye and turning it I would see the bottom of this bridge, the base, I would be able to see a little bit more of the foreground, which I think would anchor the shot as well. Um, and this is stacked, so it's nice and sharp. It's a clean image. And uh, you know, for what looks to be a, a more of a suburban setting, it's uh, fairly uh, well exposed and we've got some nice detail still in that night sky. So great shot. All right, on to a few... Um, a uh, live composite star trail images. This is in Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. So Sean, beautiful scene. I love Rocky Mountain National Park. It is a gorgeous place. Uh, and Sean indicated that there was a, a bit of moonlight illuminating it, which is wonderful on those mountaintops. So the snow covered peaks with a little bit of moonlight, we can see some of the field in the foreground lit up. We've got some car trails going through both left to right and coming sort of into the frame. Um, I like the car trails. I would be tempted to try to clean up some of those bright ones, especially the two brightest headlights. Um, they work, but I might try to get rid of uh, two of them. And then if you don't like it, bring them back in. Um, the one thing that I would suggest, you're so close to getting Polaris in here that just turning the camera a little bit to the right would allow you to get Polaris, which would be about right there. That's my fake Polaris. Um, you know, it still works. It's still a great shot, but you know, I think uh, having Polaris in there and seeing the entire kind of circle with a few of the star trails might be nice. Although maybe the, this was the best vantage point and there was nothing else. Uh, there might've been something else distracting uh, on the right. So, uh, but it is a really nice live comp image. All right, got a few more live comp images, kind of group them together here. This again looks like it's a moonlit night. We've got the tallest part of this uh, rock wall pointing towards Polaris. So now we've got the entire rings here because they're right almost in the center. The rings are, the star trails are like almost perfect spheres. Um, that's working for me. Um, and I might have considered upping the ISO here. You're shooting at ISO 500. It is a little dark. You can definitely pull that out in post to brighten it up, maybe add a curves uh, adjustment as well to bring out some you know, slight tonal differences because moonlight is fairly flat. I am going to uh, point out one thing, and I don't know if Edward noticed this happening, and I've, I'm gonna point this out because this has happened to me as well. I wanna zoom in to a couple of the star trails here. So this is one section. Ignore the fact that it's pixelated because this is zoomed in quite far but you will see a sudden jog 
in each of these star trails right there, right? And so each star trail has a jog sort of at the exact same moment. And that means that the camera moved. It didn't move much. It only moved, you know, two or three pixels, it looks like. But at some point during the live comp, and this looks like it's at least an hour um, of live composite shooting, the camera moved. And so I would definitely suggest that once you start live comp shooting, don't touch the camera and don't touch the tripod. Don't accidentally hit it with your foot. Make sure it's on very solid ground because when that happens, it, you know, you can't fix it. All right. Um, it, it, and it's happened to me before and there's nothing I could have done about it right after the fact. And I didn't notice it while I was shooting. Right. Um, the other thing that I might suggest, and you don't have to do this, but we definitely have a lot of plane traffic going through this shot. It would be work to get rid of those traffic trails, but it can be done if you wanted to. Otherwise, and I'm not suggesting that you have to do that. We're used to seeing those, but there is a lot of airplane traffic going through. Um, otherwise, great shot. Right? Another image here. As far as examples of live composite shooting, awesome examples, right? You know, you can still see the colors of the stars. We've got some really beautiful exposure here with the live comp. Uh, live comp tops out at ISO 1600. So Leroy is shooting at 1600 here. And the cool thing here is this is the 14 to 150, right? This is, you know, with a maximum aperture of F4. So you can definitely still shoot the night sky at f4 you don't need one of the pro lenses that is shooting at f2.8 or f1.8 or something like that um, so you can definitely do that i will ask one question though if you were shooting this scene during the day would you compose the shot in the same way if this was blue sky or you know let's say a sunset with some nicely lit clouds would you compose the shot in the same way I'm guessing probably not, right? Composition is really important. And just having uh, the live comp is cool. But if you want to bump it up for the next shot, really focus on the composition. Having a few treetops in there isn't really anchoring the shot and adding the interest that I would hope to see um, in future images. Um, so try to find a position where you do have something in the foreground that adds some interest, and then the um, star trails just become a, a really nice backdrop. But it is a great example of live composite shooting. Right, I think this is the last live comp shot, and now we're in Tofino um, on Vancouver Island. It's an absolutely beautiful area, one of the nicest beaches I've ever seen on the Pacific coast. Um, and, you know, we've got some well-lit surf on the left. Normally, I don't like shooting into, into lights that are streaming in, but you can definitely do that with live comp. And I'm okay with that, especially because of the cool reflection. I love the ripples of sand. I love the reflection. You probably can already tell what I'm going to say based on some previous comments. I would prefer to see a little bit uh, more of that foreground. I'm also going to zoom in excuse me, uh, and focus again on the star trails. And this is, again, an issue that you might experience on occasion, nothing that Daryl did, but you can see that some of the star trails are quite faint and some of them are definitely kind of broken up. And that's because of clouds moving through. So while the live composite was happening while the shutters open, some clouds were coming through, which of course dims the starlight, and then you get these broken um, star trails. And there's nothing you can do about that while you're shooting. The only thing is, you know, try to avoid going out on a moonlit, or a, sorry, a star, ah, let's start that sentence again. Avoid going out when there's any clouds in the sky. Try to make sure that it's completely clear. You can definitely go out when it's moonlit, all right, and starlit. Okay, so otherwise, you know, I might suggest tilting the camera um, so that it's uh, in vertical format, excuse my dogs barking in the background, and uh, the horizon 
perhaps um, right about there so that we get more foreground. And because you're shooting in vertical, you wouldn't have to worry about having Polaris in the shot. It would definitely be included, especially with the 7 to 14. And one of the things I love about shooting star trails with the 7 to 14, especially if you keep Polaris in one of the corners, is you get uh, this beautiful elliptical pattern to it. Um, especially if you're shooting for, let's say, an hour, hour and a half, you get some really cool elliptical pattern. So nice image. All right. No more live composite. On to some more Milky Way shots. And this one is incredible. Stephen, I am jealous. I have been wanting to photograph some of the lighthouses on the East Coast for quite some time. And it this is an excellent example of that. Compositionally, an awesome shot. My only suggestion would be in your post-processing, um, I would try to balance the exposure between the Milky Way and the Lighthouse a little bit. The Milky Way is perhaps a little bright and we've lost some of the details and the colors in the Milky Way. And it looks as if you have perhaps purposely muted the, um, the Lighthouse. I, I would like to see that brought out a little bit more. Brighten up the lighthouse, um, even the, the building, the light keeper's house, brighten that up a little bit and perhaps tone down the Milky Way um, and, and get a little bit more exposure balance there. But it is an awesome, um, it's an awesome scene and it's a well-composed scene. All right, moving on. Whew, look at this. The Aurora. I think this was the only Aurora shot. And I know that George in his description said that he was going out to photograph the Milky Way. But I'll tell you, the Aurora trumps everything when you're out shooting. And I've done that myself. I've gone out to photograph uh, the uh, the Milky Way, you know, had, wanting to head south somewhere to uh, to. Uh, photograph the Milky Way and then turn the car north the instant that I knew that the Aurora were out. And I'm hoping to capture some Aurora again this month because we are heading into uh, more increased activity uh, with the sun. And so I hope to shoot it. I like this composition. It's a really cool foreground subject, this old rusty car. Um, the Aurora are, this is a great display of Aurora. You know, I, uh, I'm jealous when I see people shoot uh, this because I don't usually get it like this. Um, I am going to look at your settings here for a moment. You didn't provide settings, but um, I'm guessing that based on that focal length of 17 millimeters, that would be about equivalent to 35 millimeters. Um, and I do see some star movement, which isn't an issue at all when you're dealing with the Aurora. But it, so that makes me think that this, this is probably about 20 seconds exposure. When you're photographing the Aurora, I would suggest not going beyond six, seven, eight seconds max with the Aurora. I didn't talk about this last week with the Aurora, but they dance. They move across the sky quite quickly. And you wanna to try to capture that dance with as much definition as possible. If your exposure is too long, those lights begin to sort of blend together and get kind of soft and mushy and we, want to avoid that. So keep the shutter speed at about five, six seconds. Um, and if you, and you probably don't even need to increase the ISO because during a good display, those Northern lights can be quite bright. Right? So that would be one uh, suggestion uh, that I would make the next time you're photographing the Aurora. Now, as far as post processing goes, cause that is a big part of shooting. Um, I definitely noticed something right there, all right? There seems to be some weird little spot there. Um, and it almost looks like, it's almost like a lens, right? Uh, looking at it. Well, I know what that spot is. Um, this is a cloned portion of the image. And so what George has done, there must've been something there and cloning, I do it all the time, is absolutely a legitimate technique to get rid of a distraction. Um, that spot, came from here, all right? That, you can see the trees are exactly the same. And that again, isn't a big deal. Most people would never even notice that. What makes this noticeable is that when you're using the clone stamp, avoid using a hard brush. There's a hard edge to this. Soften the edge and try to make sure that the line, like the horizon line matches up. 
right? So whatever was cloned out of there, that's fine, but uh, soften it up a little bit. Otherwise, you know, it's a great image. All right, we're on to the last five photographs. So of course, this wasn't just a critique, it's a little bit of a contest. And so these are the five photographs that for me stood out for a variety of reasons, and they're all quite different. And then the final photograph um, is one where we are giving away a brand new 12 millimeter f2.0 Olympus lens, and um, we'll save that one for the very end. The rest of them are in no particular order, and uh, I want to address each of those individually. Here we go. So this is Laura out in Colorado, and this is definitely astro landscape and landscape kind of mixed together. So we are shooting, Laura was shooting it in the blue hour. We definitely see lots of stars, but I love the foreground. I love the colors of the aspen leaves. Um, I love the reflection. I'm wondering if I could make, I mean, even with these featured photographs, I'm going to offer some suggestions. Um, I see what looks to be algae in uh, you know, a large part of the lake here. If there was a way of perhaps moving in a place where there, you wouldn't see it as much, or you can actually eliminate a lot of that by getting the camera down lower, shoot closer to the ground, and that becomes a far narrower band, um, and you would actually see more of the reflection of some of those really beautifully colored aspen leaves. If there was also something in the foreground that you could have included, like a rock sticking out of the water or a piece of driftwood or something like that, that might have added some foreground interest. But I love the shot. Um, definitely a, a, a great image. All right. Here's something that I don't do, but it definitely caught my eye. I do not do this kind of light painting, but I admire people who do. So, Pavel, this is a great image. It, um, you, you obviously know what you're doing, and I envy that because I have no clue how this is done. I have a, a sense, but uh, it, it's a great shot. I love the symmetry of the glowing orbs. The reflection is absolutely perfect. Um, but if you're aiming for symmetry, I might suggest that that purple one be exactly in the center of the building in, in the background, right? Because that building also has symmetry to it. And so, you know, having that kind of symmetry, especially with man-made objects, we notice when there is asymmetry when you're aiming for symmetry. So I might have shifted the the glowing orbs over. I know that required planning and so on. So, um, but that might be one suggestion. And because this is definitely a very center-weighted shot, I might suggest shifting into a vertical format, get more reflection in the water, and perhaps include Polaris. Now, Polaris wouldn't be exactly over the spire, which would be ideal, but I still think including it might have added it and getting rid of some of the stuff on the edges. But it's something that I really admire, and it's a great example of this kind of light painting. Nice shot. All right. I love this image. I love shooting old buildings. And here, in, I don't think anywhere in Canada, except for perhaps Quebec City, do we have any buildings look that look like this. Um, it's a great composition. It uh, is a composite blend. I love the foreground. I love the sky, the placement of the Milky Way in it, the aerial view. I might suggest bringing up the foreground details. Otherwise, this is great. I wish I was there. All right. Um, on to this shot uh, of, I think this is the boot arch in the Alabama Hills. Um, Nom, fantastic image. I believe this is stacked and using some low level lighting for the foreground. We've also got some accent lighting, you know, that either someone is back there lighting up the interior of that arch or you've placed a light there while you were shooting. Um, looks awesome. I love this, this kind of structure. And I've Love the um, the way the Milky Way is, is stretched out. I think maybe a little more to the, uh, shifting the camera more to the right so that we could uh, see a little bit more of the Milky Way, maybe. Um, well, the one uh, suggestion that I would uh, like to uh, offer is lighting up a little bit more of that foreground. Um, I, I think the, the lighting that you've got on the rocks is really nice and even. It, it's 
perfect lighting there, but the foreground darkens very quickly. And I personally would like to see more of that foreground lit. I don't know that you could pull any details out of that in Lightroom. Um, I might suggest now that you, you know, with this image, it's cropping out that, uh, that darkened area. Um, otherwise, it's a great image. And uh, one day, Nam, I'd like to go shooting with you again, because of course, Nam and I have shot together uh, in California, in San Francisco, I believe it was. All right, the last shot goes to Seth. And Seth, I hope you're watching. Congratulations on an amazing image and on winning the 12 millimeter uh, 2.0 lens. This shot drew me right in. The instant I saw it, I was sucked into here. This is in Joshua Tree National Park. I have photographed there before um, and I am in awe of this image. And Seth indicated in his description that this was his first attempt at doing astro shooting. If this is your first attempt, Seth, I can't wait to see what you do in a year or two from now. Um, this is an, an amazing, there's some amazing details in here. Like my eye is just wandering through and picking up, right? The Joshua trees, the other scrub, the beautiful rock formations. Um, I do notice a little bit of red in the foreground on the bottom right. I might work in post to try to uh, get that color consistent with the rest of the rock. I don't know what that red is from. I've seen that in my own images if I'm shooting two cameras where the red light from my neighboring camera uh, is on blinking. And so I usually use gaffer's tape to cover that red LED that we've got on the front of our cameras. Um, the only other thing that I, kind of wish that I could see was a, just a little bit more of the Milky Way on the right, right? See the entire core. But this is one kick-ass shot. I absolutely love it. So uh, congratulations on a great shot. Um, and congratulations on everybody who submitted it. These are really good images. Before we go back to Michela, I want to end up, I just kind of want to summarize by looking at perhaps three takeaways uh, from that I think apply to many of these images and apply to photography generally. First one, I said this, I was hoping, I hope I didn't bore people with saying this over and over again, but it's absolutely true. Composition needs to come first in, in your shots. Even when you're photographing the night sky, we often think, well, I, I really wanna focus on the Milky Way. I wanna capture as much of the star trails as possible. And we often do that then at the expense of whatever it is that we're shooting in the foreground and really focus on that foreground. The cool thing about photography is that we have a lot of power um, in what we show our viewers. You have the power to control what the viewer sees but just as importantly, you have the power to control what they don't see. So of, try to eliminate distractions in your shot, right? That branch that's sticking in or something else that might be intruding into the image, work to eliminate those kinds of distractions and then really focus on what it is that you, where you want the viewer's eye to rest when it's traveling around in the shot. So really focus on the composition because the night sky is just the backdrop. Second thing is, of course, this sounds cliche, photography is all about the light, which it is, but of course, we're kind of dealing with two types of light here in Astro. We're dealing with the starlight and the natural light that's out there in the sky, but then we're also dealing with either the ambient light coming from some artificial source or the light that we're adding to it, and you try want to try to make sure that those lights blend well together in the image that one of them isn't overpowering the other, right? So really work on, on the lighting. And then of course, the third thing is after you're done shooting, right? Don't underestimate the power of post-processing. There is a lot that you can do in post and I encourage you to do so. Too many photographers spend all this money on their gear and are hesitant to spend it on, you know, the subscription to Lightroom and, and Photoshop or buying a, 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 a better quality post-processing package. You need, if you're going to take your photography seriously, you have to uh, begin spending the money and the time 
on, on post-processing because it will make a huge, huge difference to your images. Um, there isn't any of my images that you saw that weren't post-processed, that weren't edited after the fact. Um, if you actually saw the raw images, they would be incredibly underwhelming. All right. And so with that, I'm going to get out of my uh, slideshow here, go back to Michela. And if there are any questions, I would love to answer them. Yeah, we do have a couple questions already out there. Uh, I'm just going to remove this really quick. There was one. I just want to go back a little ways because I saw two that stood out for me. Uh, where is it? Jamie, where'd you go? You had a good one. So is Milky Way season different in the Northern Hemisphere? Is it different? So I'm assuming that Jamie is from the Southern Hemisphere. And um, I would, well, first of all, I don't know what the Southern Hemisphere Milky Way season is. <laughs> I probably should have researched that because I've never shot in the Southern Hemisphere. So for us in the North, for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, the Milky Way is below the horizon in the winter. So I'm guessing that that means that it's, winter is probably a really good time for you guys to shoot in Australia, New Zealand, and anywhere else in the Southern Hemisphere. But for us in the North, um, don't try to look for the Milky Way, at least the core of the Milky Way in the winter. March for me is the time where I start going out to shoot. April is perfect. May is perfect. I kind of stop shooting in June and July because the nights are so short, you know, I've only got a couple of hours to shoot before we hit mm -hmm. twilight again. And that's even worse, the farther north you go. Um, and then in August, I'll start shooting again. But of course, the Milky Way is then vertical and the core is beginning to migrate farther south. So yes, it is different. Um, but my apologies for not really knowing what it looks like in the southern hemisphere. But please, if you'd like to invite me to your place, I'll go shooting with you in the southern hemisphere. Right. We could all use a little Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> sure. So one more from, let's see, Mary Beth. So not sure if you can speak real quick on how the photographers are getting such depth and color in their Milky Ways. And I know we can't speak for other photographers, but maybe I thought you would have some tips and trips, tips and tricks even for your own shooting. Right. Um, so the color of the stars is there. And if your image is overly exposed or if you're brightening it too much in Lightroom, you're going to wash out some of that color. But I think the best way of trying to get that color to show up is by either stacking the images or tracking. So if you have a tracker, you are main, you know, you're maintaining a, a longer period of time on those stars that will help to bring out the color. And as I mentioned before, stacking, will increase the dynamic range of your shots. You will see details in a, in a stacked set of images that you would never see in a single shot. Um, so those are two possible ways of bringing out the color. Awesome. And then this one goes back out to your image you just showed at the end with your tips. How did you trip the shutter from out there, Peter? How did I so trip the Oh, so how do you that. trigger the camera? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, well, um, mm -hmm. when I am, I, I'm not too sure, Todd, if you're talking about doing a selfie. So here, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about both. All right. So if I'm just regularly shooting and I'm, and I'm nowadays I stack almost every time I'm out, I programmed in a one second delay. So I don't use the, the remote trigger and I certainly don't use the uh, app. All right. I just really? find no, never. I, I find that too cumbersome. It's a great app. Don't get me wrong. It's a great app, but I never trigger with, with the, my phone. Um, maybe I'm old school, but, uh, and I also no longer ever use my remote trigger because I'm stacking a set of 10 shots minimum. I just programmed in a one second delay, boom, press that. And I don't get camera shake. If you're concerned that you might get a little bit of shake, you could do it two seconds, or you could use the remote. Um, as far as when I'm in a selfie, like in that image that you see over my shoulder, um, what I do is add a longer delay to it because you can program in, I think up to 30 seconds with that custom mm -hmm. timer, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's a 30 second delay and, and you can do that. And then I, that gives me plenty of time to get into position, right? And if I know I need to be still, 
right? I know that I've got, I, if I can, if I haven't taped over that red LED, you can see that, right? And that lets you know when the camera is starting to uh, get ready to shoot, right? And that's how I then get into position. And if it's a selfie, I just hold my breath and count, right? Because I'm not usually looking at the camera. Usually I'm right. looking away from the camera. So I just, I literally am counting in my head. But the fact that no, the, the fact that I no longer need to use noise reduction with stacking, I don't have to count as high. <laughs> right. <gasps> That's funny that you don't use the app, and and maybe if you're saying that it, you're diff, your your shooting style is different. I use the app for like all of my night sky photography, everything, really? my live composites. Yeah, especially if it's really really cold, I'll like just use the app and bundle up in a blanket in my chair and just like watch it on my phone, building the star trails. <laughs> no, 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 never. I yeah. never ever shoot with the app. I don't know why. Maybe I should. Maybe <laughs> maybe maybe I should, and maybe it actually it would help me in my shooting. But no, nope, never do yeah. it. Well, I'm like you know the selfie queen, so I, I use the app all the time. No, I'm <laughs> <kidding>. <laughs> I can't top your selfies. I don't have any awesome Milky Way selfies, unfortunately. Well, I hope you do next year. <laughs> okay. So Someone just popped on and said they came a bit late. They want to know what camera you use. I know we talked about that on last week's episode, but maybe if you want to drop that real quick. Yeah. So I'm shooting all, almost all of them. Well, actually, now I'm shooting with two of them. So I shoot, I'd say, three quarters of my Astro shots with the OM, the EM1 Mark III. So I'm using the Mark III uh, because, mm -hmm. of course, it's got the Starry uh, Sky autofocus Starry in sky, it, yeah. right, which is awesome. The other 25% of the time, I'm using the EM5 Mark III with the fisheye lens because Ooh. in the previous session, I talked about that little trick that comes with the fisheye lens uh, where it automatically focuses on the stars, right? It automatically goes to infinity. The instant you turn on the camera, as long as you were in one of the autofocus modes, the fisheye lens resets to infinity, and then all you have to do is go into the super control panel and switch to manual, and it'll stay in at infinity. But those are the two cameras that I'm using. That was like the best tip you gave last week, by the way, because I get oh. asked that all the time about that lens, and I was yeah. like, "Yes, yeah. Peter's doing it. He's telling and, and us." I didn't, I didn't discover that tip on my own. It was somebody else <laughs> in Olympus that uh, told me that tip. Uh, but I believe it's the only lens that 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 it works with. I think so too. What was the URL? I'm just pop this up. What was the URL for the weather forecast site you mentioned? Uh, it wondering. is clearoutside.com. Oh, good. Somebody also just commented that. So thank you, Maria, for having our back. I love when the comment section helps out the comment section. Right it's on. the greatest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys are all the greatest. Yeah. Clearoutside.com <laughs> is amazing. It is not a fancy, glitzy looking website, but it's got every bit of information on the weather that you would want. And it also like predicts. So I know that for the next week, I'm going to have awesome uh, skies. Now I just have to get the motivation to get out, but that's pretty easy for me. Right, right. I My biggest problem is setting the early morning alarms because I'm like, am I really going to get up and do that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <sighs> Guess I will. So I think we've wrapped up most of the questions. There was one on noise reduction. Susan, I am going to point you back to the very beginning of this video. If you want to just rewind it to the front, Peter does go over your question in pretty good depth, I think. Um, so we won't make him redo it again. I appreciate you uh, checking that out. And congratulations to Seth. I haven't yeah. seen him comment yet, so I'm not 100% sure, but we will be reaching out to you to um, get your information so we can send you out your lens. Um, very exciting um, night tonight. And I learned a lot um, because I shoot a little bit of astro, but the pointers you gave, I'm like, oh, I do that in my shot all the time. Dang. Oh, Peter says I need to yeah. and change even if that up shot, a little bit. <laughs> and even if your shot wasn't in these 30, um, I'm hoping that you gain something out of this. Um, because a lot of those suggestions would apply to multiple shooting situations. Yeah. And if your shot wasn't included in this, please just keep in mind, I went through and helped um, or downloaded all of them. And there were some fabulous, amazing shots and crazy awesome moon shots. So thank you guys all for sending those in. We saw a lot of great work. Um, again, 
Uh, to reiterate what I say every week, but just to make sure everyone knows if you're new here, we do um, have an instant replay at the end of this session on both YouTube and Facebook. You'll be able to rewatch this later so you can really kind of go over and with a fine tooth comb all of Peter's excellent tips. And um, thank you, Peter. Thank you for all your time tonight. This has been absolutely amazing. It was a pleasure. And thank you for organizing it all, Michelle. It's a real treat. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to be here. You know, I like I like seeing everybody on Thursday nights. I'm sure you guys are sick of seeing me, but that's okay. You're gonna have to deal with it a little longer. Uh, one more time, just want to remind everyone that in two weeks from tonight, which I believe is May 20th, gosh, I hope I got the date right there. Uh, <laughs> we will be back again with another session. Our dear Steve Ball is going to be here teaching us how to build a backyard birding studio, how to attract birds to your yard, whether you're in suburbia or if you're out in the, you know, nature, lucky to be in nature, you know, so um, that's going to be a really informative session as well. And uh, we just look forward to learning with you again next time. And thank you, Peter. I really appreciate your time. And I just took a quick look at my calendar right over there and it is the 20th. Yes. And I was I so scared. Yeah, I absolutely plan on watching that because I do like birding as well. All right. Yeah. So, awesome. Thanks, everybody. Right. Have a good night. Thank you all, and I'll see you next time.